Thelonious, 1963. Don't blame me, the Criss Cross album. You're listening to Blue Notes, Blue Nights, here in New York City. Gonna be a stormy one tonight, folks. Nor'easter coming in. They're saying high winds and a heavy snowfall. So take care of yourselves. Now, a fresh outtake from a forthcoming Blue Note album by Lee Morgan. He's really flying high on this one. Is that Helen? Yeah. Yeah. That's Lee. Why wow, they were young then. I just couldn't believe it. Didn't know what to think. Because they were both together, they were always the people we related to, both of them. Uh, the fact that he had towed the car that night, came to work, and uh, still was not able to come through the night, was not able to get through the night alive, you know. I was never able to go down that street again. Like, didn't get back to New York. I was destroyed, man. And then, you know, I was curious about what happened to Helen. And then I heard that the police had arrested her and uh, taken her to jail. And, you know, I, I never saw her again. I first met Mrs. Helen Morgan in this building, Williston High School. Our classroom was situated on the first floor here, closest to the door, because whenever we had a break, Mrs. Morgan did smoke. My class was a Western civilization class. But I don't begin with the Greeks and the Romans. I begin with the ancient African civilization. So I wasn't a quote unquote traditional teacher. As a matter of fact, they didn't call me Mr. Thomas. They called me Larry. Almost all the students called me Larry. And they were, most of them were her age maybe, or they were some of them, I would say the youngest one were in their 40s. 
Mrs. Morgan struck me as a person who wasn't that academically sound, but she was streetwise. Just the aura, a vibe about her was streetwise. So as a way of introducing myself to the class, I would always hand out this uh, bio of me with my picture and everything, stating that you know I was a jazz radio announcer and a little bit of background information on who I was. When I gave it to her, she said, oh, I love jazz. So I said, really? She said, oh, yeah, by the way, my husband was a jazz musician. And her last name was Morgan. And I said, your husband, what was his name? And she said his name was Lee. So I said, Lee Morgan, the trumpet player? And she said, yeah, and she kind of looked at me kind of funny, like, you know, you know the story too, you know? So I said, well, I want to interview you one day. So she said, I don't have to think about it. So eventually in 96, I guess about eight years later, she decided that she called me and said, uh, Larry, you still want the interview? I said, yeah, of course. So I got, I borrowed a tape recorder, just a regular Sony, and I got two cassettes. I just grabbed two cassettes. I said, I got to get this interview, you know? And that was in February 1996. In March The country I never liked at all. I, my one of the biggest aim was when I was growing up in the country and I had to work on the farm and I had to do all of this, that when I got big enough, I was leaving this place. And I was, I was young then too. And then see, I had kids early. I had my first child at 13. Then I had another baby right behind that, at uh, 14, right behind. So that disillusioned me from a whole lot of things. Cause I've never want, say I wanted any children. I never. That, that, but I had them. I didn't raise them, my grandparents. I didn't raise my children. Because I left. I left. I came to Wilmington. And then I got married here. And I only knew him for a week. And this was like the fast life here. I was 17, he was 39. And he got drowned. So his family lived in New York. And I left Wilmington to stay two weeks in New York. And I never came back.
first time I met Lee Morgan, well, I was in the Army. And in the Army, we talked about anything new. Um, they, they were talking about uh, Clifford Brown, or the actor, they were talking about James Dean, the actor. And they said, Dizzy Gillespie found a trumpet player 16 years old. His name is Lee Morgan from Philadelphia. That's when I heard his name. And one weekend, I went to New Jersey home, and they said, Dizzy Gillespie's playing at Sugar Hill, the club, and Lee Morgan is there in that band. So I went to the Sugar Hill, and I saw the band, and Dizzy Gillespie was soloing. Then he was stopped. Then the next thing I saw, this young Lee Morgan stand up and started playing. It was fun to watch him almost challenge Dizzy in the band, musically. He was extremely confident, almost to the point of being cocky. And he was this bubbly, young artist who knew he was talented. I mean, there was no question about it. Lee knew that he was talented. The band, they had a band uniform, but Lee Morgan and Dizzy Gillespie and the drummer, which is a Charlie Persip, dressed different. They were like the stars, you know, of the band. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody was so, like, kind of like in shock. I mean, here's this kid, man, you know, that's playing like a, like a seasoned veteran, you know, and, and with great ideas. I mean, there was never no doubt in any, anybody's mind Lee was gonna be a star. It was common among musicians to be one of the best dressers. We talked about fashion all the time. What they called Ivy League, that was like the style then. And Lee was like really into that and so was I. You know, I have the best car. Prettiest lady, lots of money, best shoes. <laughs> and all that was important at the time. You know, I bought this Austin Healy, and uh, Lee bought a Triumph. And uh, I used to tease him about it. I said, oh, man, your car is not as powerful, it's not as fast as my car. He said, oh, man, we had to see about that. city and we would go in Central Park at night because in those days you could drive around in Central Park at night just get out the way and let me go around this turn as fast as I can you could never turn the car over Festival with Ahmed Jamal was there, Sarah Vaughn, Count Basie, the, the Jazz Messengers. Lee Morgan came running across the racetrack doing a, an intermission, and he said to me, You want to play with the Messengers? Do you want to play with the Messengers? And I said, Yeah. And he said, Come with me. And I, I jumped down on the racetrack with him and went to the dressing room where Art Blakey was. And Art said to me, you want to play in my band? He had that voice, you want to play in my band with the messengers? I said, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now beginning the third set with the terrific Art Blakey and his jazz messengers from the jazz court of the world. Lee Morgan on trumpet, Wayne Short on the tenor saxophone, Bobby Timmons on the piano, Jimmy Merritt on the bass. 
Brothers. Soul Brothers on the scene now. I'm gonna do a cool one for you. I was always known as a, a lone wolf, but um, with Lee, Lee was the friend, you know, and uh, he and I would like uh, have a debate about different things, politics. Uh, he wanted to know, to know everything. I went to Europe for the first time with them. And sometimes we were playing, and Lee would be playing a solo, and Art would be yelling to Lee, talk to the people, talk to the people, tell them your story, tell them your story. He knew how to tell a story musically, you know. Most of my part down, 53rd Street, not far from Birdland, between 8th and 9th, right around there, all right around the circle there. I could always fit in, because I was a talker. And I got a job. And then I began to meet other people. And we started going uptown to the clubs. That's when you would really hear music, the jam session, you know? And I would be invited to the after hour joints. Helen was a, a hero in my neighborhood because she came up from the South and she was a woman that had to struggle because she didn't want to work for anyone. So she wanted to be her own person. When she walked down the block in the neighborhood, the men and the women paid attention, especially the men, because she wore provocative clothes. She wore a lot of those A-line type dresses and suits. Everything fitted her because she was built very nice. And on Friday, um, she would change her outfits and come downstairs when all the guys got off from work and they'd be shooting crap, you know. And she'd go across the street, and she would shoot with them. She didn't talk a lot about her background or home or anything like that. She only talk, sort of fit into conversations when she felt it was necessary to correct something, that something was said that was not correct, that she felt uncomfortable with. That's the only time she would really say anything. I will not sit here and tell you that I was so Nice, because I was not one of the, would cut you, sh I was sharp. Yeah. yeah, I had to be, had to be, I was sharp. And I, I looked out for me. That's, that's him. Oh, he was, he was a, he could be a showman. He had his little style, you know, he'd be styling. Laugh. He had a, had a nice laugh, too. I'm not staying too close when we play the ensemble, but you mean I take my solo? 
Yeah, yeah, well, I'll step back a little bit. Yeah, I'll come in very loud. Is that it? Uh, pick four. Every time we went to record, Alfred Lyon and Frank Wolf, the, the owners of Blue Note, would bring boxes and boxes of food and everything. It was like a party. And uh, there was always a, a record that came out of those uh, six and seven hour recording sessions. We, what that group we had had a lot to do with uh, developing what was called the Blue Note sound. Here was these two guys that seemed to be as involved as the players themselves, you know. And, uh, uh, the guys used to call them the Animal Brothers. <laughs> you know, the lion and the wolf, you know. And I'll never forget Frank Wolf. All the time he would be taking pictures, he took some remarkable pictures. <laughs> Search for the New Land, he was actually digging back into his roots and history and, and what, can, what, could be, what could be achieved with freedom. I wish the world was like this. I wish, you know. When we did record, there was always the thought that this is gonna be forever. What we choose is gonna be forever. My apartment was like an open house. It was always being cooking, always cook, come to dinner, you eat, go by Helen's house. My house in 53rd Street was the place. On the first time I met my mother, I was 21. I went to her house, to her apartment, and uh, strange enough, when I knocked on the door, she said, come in. And the door was open, not locked, and we, I went in, and there was three women at the table, and I immediately recognized Helen, first time I ever seen her, because of, I guess you could say, the family resemblance to her. And we greeted each other, and she here she is, 35 or th something like that. And uh, wow, you know, that means that you was 13 when I was born. It didn't take long for me to latch on to her because she was uh, quite interesting. She worked at an answering service and they was pulling and pushing cords, you know, to make connections. It was a means of making it in New York and being a woman, being a black woman. There wasn't a whole lot of jobs for you. Everyone knew Helen because she could cook. And I used to go by and um, a lot of the musicians would be there. She would always say, listen, if you're in my neighborhood, stop by, I like to cook. And they would say, okay, I'm in her neighborhood. Let's see what she cooked today. Helen would say, um, are you hungry? And you said, nah, just, you know, maybe a little snack or something. She said, I'm gonna fix you something. She'd be out in the kitchen doing a roast pork or a turkey. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, this is gonna be great, you know? And when she put the food on the table, she might have a pie or a cake or something. And this is within an hour or two. This woman was fantastic when it came to the kitchen. She always had some good music playing. I remember that, always good jazz music playing. I remember once a party. I mean, it was a small place, but people from all walks of life. 
Most of her friends was gay or lesbian or people of people, she said. I remember this. Helen was washing up some dishes from a great meal that we all had had. And I had my camera with me, and I said, can I take your picture? She said, no, I don't like pictures. She wouldn't let people take pictures of her. But I wanted to get a picture of her. So I said something slick. I don't remember exactly what I said to her. But when I said it, she turned around, and when she turned around, I said, pop, and I caught it. As advertised, we're going to be uh, introducing in just a moment one of the uh, top jazz groups in the world uh, on the Blue Note uh, label. These fellas have been playing together since 1955, and uh, now, as I say, one of the top jazz groups in the whole world. They play all around the world, too. Uh, here we go. two-step. That's what it was all about, staying neat, get a haircut, show up on the scene. That was the whole thing. We only impress a young lady, you know. You come in like, talking about what it is. I think of the good times that we had back then. You know, there was a lot of good times. We play and we have a break, and I'd go right to the bar and get like a cognac, a double cognac, sometimes a triple, and uh, then we would eat. We all had a plan. We'd eat so we could like uh, uh, stay sober enough, uh, you know. But I was, I, I thought I was out of the army. I'm still 26 years old, 27. Um, we, we, in alcohol, you sweat it out, and you, you're never going to be staggering or uh, swaying on the bandstand. You don't stagger. It's not cool to stagger. You're supposed to be strong. I would drink and have like a thin veil around me. That's my space, my, my little dream space and everything. And uh, we would play. I'm looking at the back of his head. Yeah. There's a bandage. Mm -hmm. It's almost like in my face, what's going to happen to him? <laughs> 